problem. Um, and in a kind of related note, uh, we're going to have to develop some tools for talking about the distinguishability of quantum states. Uh, for pure states, we, all, we, we can just talk about the inner product, right? We all know that that's a great way to discuss distinguishability. But when you get into the, uh, the terrain of mixed quantum states, uh, it's not so clear anymore how you should uh, discuss the notion of the distinguishability of two states. And so we're going to have to de develop some formalism there, uh, which is just generally useful. Uh, state distinguishability. Um, of course, it's uh, a little mini course on quantum information. And no course on quantum information is going to be complete without some discussion of things like entropy and information measures. And down, uh, I guess, to last but definitely not least, uh, really one of the most profound and interesting discoveries that, it's, you know, that has come out of the study of quantum information is that there's something called quantum error correction. Uh, that quantum mechanical information, uh, whatever exactly that is, um, you might imagine that it's very fragile because it's somehow the, the state of a quantum system and that state is a vector in a complex Hilbert space. But despite the fact that uh, it's this continuously varying quantity, uh, it can actually be encoded in very robust ways. And that, as you might imagine, could be relevant to the black hole information paradox. And so these are the, the quantum information topics that we're going to uh, stumble into over the course of the next three lectures uh, as we ask, our, ask questions about the black hole information paradox. Uh, so let's start with this black hole question. So let's start with a We'll have our black hole here. Um, and just for the purposes of the lectures, I'm going to write down some basic, uh, basic quantities. A black hole, this is just going to be a short shell black hole. We're going to talk about a very simple, uh, you know, so the simplest example. Um, and so our black hole has a mass. And the short shelled radius of that black hole is proportional to the mass. Uh, of course, the area of the black hole is proportional to the square of the radius. Um, and the interesting one is that the entropy of the black hole is proportional to the area. These are the basic, uh, the basic relationships that we need to, well, uh, that we're going to need. Um, and I guess as an LHF, uh, some of the other talks that have taken place, I'm going to set h bar is equal to c is equal to g is equal to 1. And also calling Alexandro's lead, I really like the idea of setting those equal to minus 1 and 2. That uh, a lot of, gives me a lot of latitude to make mistakes. Uh, and so I'll, I'll do the same thing there. Um, so as, uh, as Hawking taught us, black holes are not completely black, short shell black holes. Uh, uh, they radiate a little bit. So there's some Hawking radiation. And in Hawking's calculation, uh, the radiation that came out of the black hole didn't, didn't depend in any way on the microstate of the black hole. It only depended on these macroscopic quantities, basically the mass, right? They depended on the area. Uh, and so um, that created a question, right? If a, if a black hole is evaporating away, and it's, as it evaporates, the, uh, the radiation carries away the mass, um, eventually the black hole evaporates away to nothing. And if the radiation at no point uh, carried away the information about how the black hole was formed, then a pure state of a uh, a pure state of a uh, of the universe that collapsed into a black hole would eventually get converted into a mixed state, and that would be inconsistent with unitary uh, unitary evolution prescribed by quantum mechanics. Yeah. Uh, so you said that the radiation does not depend on the microstate of the black hole. So what what properties of the radiation don't depend on the microstate? Uh, okay. Well, um, the original calculation, right? Like. A, I fully expect the radiation to, de to depend on the microstates in the black hole and ultimately carry away all the information that's required to form the black hole. Um, but the, uh, in the case of a short shell black hole, the only variable lying around here is the mass. Right? And so that's essentially all of the radiation property. The, the properties of the radiation only depend on the mass. So the state of the radiation will not depend on the state of the black hole? The state of the radiation will not well. depend. Uh, well, the radiation, again, this is a, you know, a bit kind of 
the nature of the, the question that we're, we're trying to get at. But I think in the original calculation, the answer is no. Um, so, uh, but I, I don't think that's consistent with quantum mechanics, right? Yeah. Okay. But it's interesting. Imagine that you have, I don't know, the box, few of these atoms, the oxygen atoms, yeah. and temperature, and it can be pure state, right? and then there is a small hole, and atoms slowly go one by one. Mm -hmm. well, of course, you will have thermal radiation, but can I say there's the same paradox, or somehow this paradox? Uh, well, there, there's no paradox, uh, because uh, when you look at the radiation coming out of the box, uh, you describe it using a mixed state, uh, essentially because you're, you're averaging over back degrees of freedom. No, no, I, right? my, my, my whatever, whatever inside this can be in pure state. Okay, but now, now wait until everything, uh, all, all the particles in the box have evaporated out of the box, right? You actually still expect the state of the particles that have come out of the box to be in a mixed state, but that's only because the particles in the box interacted with the walls of the box. Uh, there, there was a thermal bath. Uh, no, I don't need thermal baths. I okay. got perfect reflection. So. Okay, well, in that case, you end up with a, with a pure state once, yes. once all the particles have come out. Yes, but it's, to see that, I have to, I, I cannot just detect particles. I have to detect all particles together. So yeah, it's going to be in some very complicated correlation shared among all the particles, for sure. Okay. Uh, Why cannot it happen with these particles? Uh, well, I actually think that it does happen. Right? Um, but the, uh, the question is really going to be, how does it happen? I mean, Hawking, when Hawking did this calculation in the 70s, his claim was the information flows. Uh, despite what we have on most of the Because everything in the calculation, there's no information that any two Hawking would have to solve. And it was very people tried for decades to argue that there was something he was missing that would give you correlations. It turns out to be very, very hard to make that argument. Um, no one's totally nailed down. We now have other reasons to believe it's definitely not true. Um, but, uh, but no one's really ever nailed down where Hawking's got to put from. It's just like to find the perturbations here. What is it? No, it's, it's done in a limit, and the limit that the space time is semi possible, but that limit will hold very well. There's no reason to do it. Oh, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, I mean, he was just responding that there have, you know, there have been, since Hawking made this, uh, you know, this claim back in the 1970s, uh, there was a sustained effort, right, over several decades to find a mechanism uh, whereby the correlations could be imprinted into the Hawking radiation. Um, and uh, those efforts basically all failed. Uh, um, that even though, yeah, uh, that, that's basically the story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how do you define information? Sorry? What is exactly the definition of information? Uh, He's asking what is the definition of information in this case? Oh, okay. Uh, well, we're, we're going to be very specific about information. Um, I, I, at the moment, I really just want to kind of set the stage. Um, and so I prefer to actually postpone that question. But I think actually, I mean, it's a very good question um, because you have, to, you have to properly pose it before you can actually make sense of these questions. Um, and as the, as the lectures go on, we're going to use uh, a few different definitions that are closely related to each other. Um, okay. Uh, so, let, well, actually, let's try to be a little bit more specific now. Um, so let's, uh, let's look at a black hole. I like this coordinate system. Um, call it the crushed all coordinates for the black for the black hole. So what we have here is the singularity is sitting on a on a hyperbola. Uh, the horizon uh, is on this uh, this line u equals zero, and so this is the exterior region, uh, and this is the interior. And these coordinates are chosen so that the light rays, uh, ingoing and outgoing of radial light rays, are parallel to the u and v axes. So this is uh, an ingoing and an outgoing light rays. And so now, let's, uh, you, know, you ask, what do I mean by information coming out of a black hole? Or we can actually even say something, like maybe we prepare a spin. 
there's some particle. We prepare it outside the black hole. We allow it to fall in. Okay? And the question is whether the Hawking radiation uh, is ultimately going to be able to tell us, you know, by looking at the Hawking radiation, can we figure out what that quantum state phi was? Or at least, uh, can, we prepare, can we extract the quantum information about, about the quantum state phi? I mean, with any quantum system, you can't learn phi just by measuring the quantum system, but you can uh, essentially extract the quantum information, perform an effective measurement. Uh, the statistics are the same as if you measured the system, the original spin. Um, so let's ask the question, uh, does that information escape? And there are two possibilities. The first one, of course, is just the answer is no. And if the answer is no, uh, then we just know that physics is not unitary. And this poses problems that I don't want to get into, but people have argued that uh, it's very hard to construct uh, a fundamental physical theory which is not unitary, that you end up with uncontrolled heating of empty space and other problems like that. So that this is a, a, pro you know, uh, a problematic uh, direction to go in, but perhaps you know, not an insurmountably problematic, problematic direction. Uh, and the, other, the alternative is that the quantum information about this state phi comes out. So there's Hawking radiation. Uh, coming off the event horizon of the black hole. Uh, and if the answer is yes, that the information comes out, uh, then eventually the quantum information uh, should be sitting outside the black hole in that radiation. But one thing we also know about black holes is that if the black hole, yeah? So if I do translate, what you mean is that am I able to, by a measurement of the Hawking radiation, to recover what was the state of the particle that entered. Um, so that's what you mean by that, 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 that. You can't quite do that because if, if someone prepares even just a spin for you, uh -huh. right, uh, and then says, and they hand you the spin, uh -huh. by a measurement of the spin, you can't recover the quantum state phi, right? But you can perform a measurement and you can predict what the outcome statistics are going to be. Uh, and the outcome statistics of, of uh, sufficiently large collection of measurements uniquely determine the quantum state phi. And so I'd be saying the same question here, that there is some set of measurements. For any set of measurements that you want to perform on the original state, okay. there's a set of measurements on the radiation whose outcome statistics would be exactly the same. And if you change the okay. quantum state here, the outcome statistics of uh, when you measure the radiation change uh, identically. So if you have a large black hole, uh, the event horizon is not actually a region of any particular importance. But the curvature near the event horizon is not large. Uh, and so, um, at least Einstein's theory of general relativity predicts that nothing special should happen at the event horizon. And so we also expect this quantum information to be sitting inside the black hole. Okay? And if it's really the case that the quantum information is inside the black hole and in the Hawking radiation, um, then you end up with two copies of that quantum state uh, sitting on the same space-like slice, right? One outside the black hole and one inside the black hole. Uh, and this uh, is itself now problematic for quantum mechanics, right? Uh, and this will be our first you know, mini, mini uh, theorem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been told you know, an outside observer will never see the particles get into the black hole. So how? This is, a, okay, this is an excellent question. Uh, and we're, we're going to run in that direction eventually. Right? That, uh, that one proposed way out of the confusion that arises here is to try to restrict yourself to being very operational. And this is not really operational. Like, uh, although it, it is inconsistent with a sort of direct application of quantum state. Right? That we, we, should not have, we should not be able to create two copies of quantum state on a single space like slice, but keep your observation in mind. Uh, we're going to get there. Okay, so if the answer is yes, uh, then we end up with uh, two copies of phi on the same space life size. And the two copies you mean, Patrick, the one inside and the one outside? Yeah, exactly. Uh, sort of, I drew just slightly messy dotted line here. Uh, 
Okay, so you probably all know this already, but it's always good to, you know, for the first result to be one that we all know, or most people know how to prove. And this is a super simple, um, but really surprisingly powerful observation about quantum mechanics. Um, and basically the observation is that you should not be able to do this kind of thing. So, uh, why are there two copies? Um, well, by hypothesis, we're saying that, it, uh, that the information has come out. And so, by hypothesis, it's, it's possible to recover uh, that, that, that quantum information is sitting in the Hawking radiation somehow. It might be encoded in a very complicated way in multi-particle correlations, but it's out there. Um, at the same time, because we, uh, we expect from the equivalence principle of general relativity that nothing special happens when we cross the horizon, uh, that if you built a laboratory, you know, and had, you know, um, I don't know, had an ion trap, um, and somebody prepared the state of one of your ions, and then you, you dropped your laboratory through the event horizon of the black hole, there's every reason to expect that the quantum information is going to be preserved as you cross the horizon, and that it's going to be sitting in the interior. Right? Um, so that's why we end up with two copies. Is that, yeah? But the Hawking radiation is not going to be emitted at the point when the laboratory crosses the horizon. It can be emitted at any later point, which will all change the Yeah, so there's a, there's a calculation to be done. Uh, but, but it is possible to construct a space-like slice that will uh, intersect the trajectory and, also, and capture almost all of the Hawking radiation uh, that is emitted after uh, the crossing of the, of the horizon. So, or the crossing of the spring horizon. Yeah. <laughs> So, but what if I do something pedestrian? So I have like normal unitary evolution, which I understand, and then do some time transformation, like dt is equal to e to the minus t times tau. Mm -hmm. So this gives me, gives me horizon, of course, because t goes from 0 to infinity, tau from 0 to say 1 more. So, and then, but I know this is just unitary transformation. I know I'm not losing any system. Will I see the same paradox? You won't see the same paradox, because you won't have the quantum information on two, sp on, uh, two copies of the same space-like slice. In those cases, I mean, this is basically just an acceleration. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't evaporate. There's no paradox. Stuff can disappear behind the acceleration, whereas you never can have so the secret motivation, but since it just it doesn't change anything. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to go move forward just a little bit here. So let's say the same is going to be that no physical evolution. And implement. Phi goes to two copies of phi. Uh, for all phi. And there's an important caveat when phi is unknown. Kind of important when you're stating the no quoting theorem. Uh, to be precise about what you mean. Oh, yeah. Are you able to make more precise what you mean by the same thing like that with inside and outside the Um I'm not going to be precise, but I can give you a reference. If you want. Yeah. Right. So, I, I'll, I'll pick up a reference and, and pass it on. Uh, I have a question. <laughs> do you need your space time to be globally hyperbolic? Uh, do I need to be globally hyperbolic? Uh, for what purpose? So that we have Cauchy surface and we um, The no cloning theorem should hold regardless. Um, Although, I mean, that's actually an interesting question. Like when, when, you, when you get around in a situation where you have closed timeline curves or something, it's hard to make sense of at all of what's, hap what's happening. Um, but as long as you can, so there, there will be some kind of condition required to exclude, exclude real topologies if you want to have a, a no-cloning theorem. Uh, but I think as long as you have linear evolution uh, in the region of interest, uh, then that's going to be enough. OK. so. It's, it's certainly the case uh, that if I want to uh, prepare a spin in the upstate, then I can make as many spins as I like in the upstate. 
right? There, there's no obstacle in that. There's no, there's no obstacle to, uh, pr to preparing many copies of, of a quantum system all in the same state. But if I don't know the state that's being prepared and all I'm given uh, is the spin itself, right? Then it's impossible to reproduce another quantum system in exactly the same state in such a way it's going to work regardless of what the state was when we started. And that's the no-cloning theorem. And just for good measure, let's, uh, let's prove it. Uh, it's perhaps the easiest. I mean, the easiest proof is just to observe that it's a nonlinear transformation. Uh, but let, let's be a little bit more, and quantum mechanics is linear, let's be a little bit more explicit. Uh, so what we need is a unitary U uh, such that U acting on phi and then also acting on the original system. And it's going to be or on the second system. And I'll just say the, the second system starts off in some fixed state, which I'll call zero. And to be extra general, let's say that we can write the uh, we can, we can give ourselves access to some extra apparatus degrees of freedom, right? So in addition to the two, say the two spins, uh, there might be a whole apparatus sitting around. And the state of the apparatus also does not depend on the state of the spin that we're starting with. Uh, and what we want is for this to produce phi, phi, and then the state of the apparatus can end up in some function of phi. That would be totally fine. Right? So when we throw away the state of the apparatus, we're left with two copies. And the statement is that there's no unitary that will do this. And how do you check it? Well, you just verify what happens to inner products. So let's track inner products. two states that we're supposed to be able to clone, uh, the inner product is going to be phi 1, 0, 0, inner product phi 2, 0, 0, which is just the inner product between phi 1 and phi 2. Right? Super easy. Uh, but then if you think about after, we're going to have the inner product between a phi 1, another phi 1, an f of phi 1, a phi 2, a phi 2, and an f of phi 2. So this is equal to inner product phi 1, phi 2, squared, because we have it twice. And then the inner product between the f's. Okay, so any inner product is between 0 and 1. So this is less than or equal to the inner product of phi 1, phi 2. And provided phi 1 and phi 2 are not the same state or orthogonal, the inner product squared is strictly less than the inner product, right? So this is strictly less than the inner product of phi 1, phi 2, if the two states are not the same or not. Uh, um, well, I just, I, so a unitary transformation is always going to pr preserve inner products. And so in particular, it's going to preserve the modulus of the inner product. So, uh, so I, just, I just put them on there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, OK, so what do we see? Well, the inner product before cannot be the same as the inner product afterwards, right? So uh, what, we, what we found is that this cloning process just can't exist. It's inconsistent with quantum mechanics. And when people, have, you know, when, when I first started looking at these sorts of questions, people talked about the black hole information paradox. I didn't know why it was a paradox, right? It just seemed like a sort of a question, a problem. But in this form, it really actually does seem like it's a kind of a paradox. Because at least if you want to preserve unitarity, you know, you, or if you say, I'm going to preserve unitarity, what you find is you seem to be backed into a corner where you conclude that the process 
has to clone, which is itself a violation of unitarity. Right? Uh, and so this is, you know, this is sort of getting closer to, uh, say, you know, suggesting why this is uh, paradoxical. So we, I'll just put some words in here. Apparently, and so this is an apparent violation of unitarity. All right. Um, there certainly could be, um, and it might not even be that subtle. Uh, so we're going to. Uh, I think we're almost there, actually. What was I going to say next? So next, I want to talk about possible resolutions. Uh, one of which would be a violation of the equivalence principle. Um, so, so what do we do with this? Question. Uh huh. Well, so suppose left pole is, is sort of my door, and I create particle pole pair with momentum k minus k. We have particles. One disappears, one appears. So how, how does it translate? So why this is different? Uh, okay. So why is this different? Um, is, is this definitely a unit? Uh, I, I mean, you're again, you're not cloning quantum information in this context, right? You're, you're preparing to state a pair, of, uh, a pair of particle states why that are entangled with each other. Yeah, I guess my question, why in black holes? Um, What's the difference? So the difference, uh, I, I think, is this, uh, is, this geom is this geometrical statement, right? Or it, it's, this, uh, it's this conclusion that we get from the equivalence principle that the quantum information should exist inside, right? That we have, we have two different reasons uh, for concluding at, at, at a particular time uh, that the quantum information is, both, is, uh, is in a particular place. The equivalence principle tells us the quantum information should be inside the black hole at least until you get close to the singularity. Uh, and then by hypothesis, we're saying the quantum information is going to be outside. And so the question you know, would be, um, do you, does the quantum information traveling into the black hole get, uh, get close to a region where we, can, we really don't think that we have a, a, a handle on what's going on? Um, but if, say, my door, suppose I get radiation yeah. only from the door, yeah. and half of radiation goes this way, half of that way, mm -hmm. and I always get uh, pairs which are perfectly correlated, and K-minus sure. K yeah. spin up spin down. Mm -hmm. So this is a unitary process. And in some sense, information there is the same as here. There is no problem with going. So. Um, but it's not the information in the sense that I'm describing here, right? Uh, and it, it's not, it, it's, it's entanglement. But you're not producing two copies of the same quantum state. Right. Right. Presumably, uh, you'd have to measure the state of both to get the state of the door. Yeah. Or so at least. Like here, we assume that we need to measure only one. Right. Yes. So there you need to know when it's oh, so you're saying that it, you don't need to measure inside. You don't need to measure inside. That it's sufficient to act on the Hawking radiation to recover a system in the quantum state time. Oh. Could you repeat why you get these two problems? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the yeah the well the reason I get two copies um, again I mean. I guess I, I want to focus a lot on the quantum information side of things, and so I've sort of glossed over you know, the, really how these calculations are done. Uh, but uh, our hypothesis is that at some time uh, in the future, if you collect enough Hawking radiation, uh, you're going to be able to recover the quantum state of Okay, uh, And independently of that, Right? If we think about the physics of a freely falling observer passing through the event horizon and staying a, a, you know, far away from the singularity, uh, then we expect the quantum information uh, being carried by that observer uh, to, uh, to be preserved and to be sitting inside the black hole. And then the question is, does there exist a space-like slice uh, that both will intersect uh, the vast majority of the Hawking radiation uh, that occurs after the infalling observer 
passes through, a, say, a, a region just uh, outside the event horizon. Uh, and the eventual ev uh, evaporation of the black hole. And such surfaces exist, right? So that's the, that's the argument. Okay. Sorry, Dave, maybe one Yeah. This is a problem, hoping if there are no remnants. I mean, if there was always something there, you could always say it's like part of the world, it's always entangled right. in states. I mean, this happens only because remnants of other problems. I I agree. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, you're, you're saying that as far as the size is concerned, it doesn't know when it's crossing the event horizon. Uh, it, it doesn't. doesn't no, certainly, it doesn't know when it, the event horizon is a global feature. It doesn't know when it's it crossing the event horizon. That's right. Um. That I mean, those are those are closely related issues. Yeah. Uh, this yes, this is cloning of an unknown quantum state, as in the in the way that I formulated it. Um, okay. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so when you formulate the non cloning theorem, you assume that you have a nice Hilbert space and everything like that, uh, and you define the person in some space-like slide, uh, some time direction. Yes. Yeah, so when you look at your space, then you take some space like slice and on the formula you're Gilbert's view. Yeah. So what's the so what's the justification so what's the for Gilbert's space when you look at the on what space like slice are your Gilbert spaces when you fall into a black hole? Or in this scenario. Um so it's actually not necessary uh to have any, uh, the space like set, uh, to have a, I mean, the way that I formulate the no cloning theorem, I've written it for a, a pure state. Uh, so, uh, but it's actually sufficient to just have, uh, to talk about, uh, talk about mixed states, right? So it would be fine here to say that sort of our rest of the world system starts off in a mixed state. And so in that case, it's sufficient uh, to not worry about extending the space like slice, but only sort of worry about some, uh, some piece of it, uh, and then we would we would be talking about the state, say, of the quantum field uh, on that space-like slice. Um, but these translated in time uh, along this trajectory that's yeah. given by the solid line. So that trajectory is not always the space; it's always time trajectory. Right? Because once uh, I, I, I agree. Right. Space yeah. Space, so that's okay. Um, no, the trajectory is full time. Sorry? The trajectory stuff. No, no, no. RAT, the light comes in the R, in the RT coordinates, the light comes. But that path diagram, the future of two forty five degree lines is always time. It's always cold. That's the point of the Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. I mean I would like to move forward a little bit to give you a little bit more information. but so where are we left, right? So there, there's, there's evidence from ADS-CFT, which I think you know, has been discussed here before, uh, that the evolution really does seem to be unitary, right? And so we want to try to make sense uh, of this situation, right? Um, and again, I'm going to go very quickly through this because I want to get to some quantum information stuff. Uh, so there was this uh, student suggested you know, remnants. Right? We only run into a problem, uh, ultimately, uh, or, well, I wasn't going to talk about remnants. Um, but one can imagine a scenario where the black hole doesn't evaporate completely. Right? At least uh, some version of the Earth, some aspects of this confusion are resolved then. Right? Because then we're, we can escape the problem uh, of, of an evolution that goes from a pure state to a mixed state if we're always left with degrees of freedom inside the black hole. Uh, but there are other issues with this, so I'm just going to sort of cross it out for the moment. Um, something that has come up this, in this past year, and that we'll discuss more on the third day, uh, is firewalls. And this is essentially a gross violation of the equivalence principle. Um, and the suggestion there is that actually maybe there is no interior of the black hole, essentially. Maybe the moment you hit the event horizon, uh, you burst into flame, you know, terrible things happen to you. Uh, that would be such a terrible violation of the equivalence principle that I think it's odious, uh, but 
uh, people are discussing this because they can't quite see how to get out of it. Um, but at least for people, uh, what gave uh, comfort to people before was an idea called black hole complementarity. And the idea behind black hole complementarity would be that the description uh, of the physics from the point of view of the infalling observer uh, would be complementary uh, to the description of the physics from the point of view of an observer who stays outside the black hole, just as what's suggested by the audience. Right? So in the same sense that the description of, the, of physics in the position basis is complementary to the description of, the, of physics in the position basis, well, we would then conclude that these two copies of phi, one of which uh, is existing in the description of the exterior observer, and the other one which is existing in the description of the infalling observer, would not be independent of each other. Right? Uh, and so let's just say the infalling, or, so the description uh, from the point of view of the infalling and exterior observers descriptions are complementary. So, like position and momentum. So this was proposed by Suskin, Thorlacius, and Uglum back in the 1990s. Um, and it has a consequence. And the main consequence, uh, it, well, we, we would say that the cloning is therefore fictitious. So any experiment to detect it should fail. Right? Just like in the, back in the early days of quantum mechanics, uh, the origin of the uncertainty principle uh, came from thinking about experiments where you try uh, to measure, the, say, the position of a particle of higher and higher accuracy, and you found that you, you thereby actually kicked the particle, making it impossible to determine its, uh, its momentum with high accuracy. Right? So in, this, in the same spirit, here, if we want to kind of test the robustness of, of this idea, what we should see, what we should try to do, is see whether uh, attempts to verify the existence of both of these clones um, fall down for some reason, right? And if, they, if, if and if when we try to construct these thought, the, these experiments, we find fundamental reasons that they can't be performed, then we can develop some confidence, perhaps, that this that this is a reasonable idea. Okay, so this is what we're going to focus on today and tomorrow, and we'll hopefully talk about firewalls a little bit more on the, on the third day. Question? Yeah. So I understand this complementary idea, but I don't see how it resolves the uh, cloning thing. Because uh, you know, there the idea is that you have two clones. Here, we are just talking about making observations. Uh, well, so the idea is that there would be some, very, you know, some large Hilbert space, right? Uh, and there's going to be some rules for um, how you map actions of an observer, an exterior observer, uh, into observables that act on the Hilbert space. And there's going to be another rule for how you do that for the involved observer. Uh, and if there's, only, if there's only one Hilbert space, right, if the rules can be such that uh, experiments by observer one, which are sort of being performed in uh, a different basis, can have access to phi, even as uh, observer two uh, also has access to phi. Is there any, um, like this phi length spread over both the interior and the exterior, or is that that question? I, I don't even know if that question quite makes sense. It, it doesn't make sense in this context, yeah. right? Yeah. That yeah, there's only one Hilbert space. Like, uh, in the picture that we draw, if you think about uh, the, defining a state of a quantum field on the space-like slice, uh, then there are observables on the left, and those commute with observables on the right. But these observables are just not commute with each other, the interior and exterior observables. So does this mean that Measuring, uh, in many cases, you cannot talk to each other. So, 
Sorry? Does this mean that if someone measure inside, measures inside and someone measures outside, in any case they don't talk to each other? So. Uh, well, they, they might be able to talk to each other, right? So let's, uh, let's think about a thought experiment, the one that we're going to discuss. Okay, so I'm just going to draw this picture again. Um, so here we're going to have my protagonist, Alice, with her quantum state, her spin. She falls into the black hole. Okay? Um, and again, there's Hawking radiation coming out here. And at some point in the future, she has a partner named Bob, right? So Bob stays outside the black hole. He collects Hawking radiation. Uh, and he stays outside long enough that he can collect enough Hawking radiation to extract the quantum state phi. And then he hops into the black hole ch trying to chase down Alice. Right? So this is the sense in which there's a chance that they might be able to, commute, uh, to exchange notes if Bob actually chases Alice into the black hole. Now, as I've drawn it, uh, Alice and Bob are going to hit the singularity without ever actually comparing notes. Right? So that's all right, uh, that there's no violation of cloning here. Um, and so if they actually did want to compare notes, what we should have, oh, what we should make happen is that Alice, uh, who is falling, uh, falling into the black hole, after she crosses the event horizon, she should turn around uh, and shine a light in Bob's direction, right? Uh, and try to get that information to Bob, carrying the quantum, uh, the quantum state. So Alice is going to try to send a message to Bob. Right, so this is the radial out direction. Okay, my question is that yeah. Bob doesn't even get to the point where he does see Alice fall into the black hole. How would he ever see anything? He doesn't see Alice hole? fall into the black hole if he uh, is a short shell observer. Right? So if he stays outside. Yeah. Uh, but he's a different kind of observer now. He's oh, an infalling observer. Yeah. But, but when he was outside, he didn't see her Yeah, I mean, he, has a, you know, he, he checks his watch, right? Uh, he's, he doesn't care about Alice, you know, what, what's happening to her. He's just collecting Hawking radiation. And he needs to collect, you know, he says, okay, if I collect 35 years of Hawking radiation, uh, that's, that's enough for me, and then I'm going to jump into the black hole. But when does he collect it? After he passes, or he gets more eyes? The Hawking radiation. No, no, he, he, he collects it outside. outside. He's, he's collecting it outside here. Yeah, but he can only see Alice falling black hole forever. How is that walking radiation ever coming to get? Um, so whether or, not whether or not Bob sees, uh, and when Bob sees Alice cross the horizon, kind of immaterial to this question. Yeah, it's, it's never going to happen if Bob is stationary and outside. Right? But again, if we're sort of thinking about this in quantum mechanical terms, uh, if you want, I mean, I don't think this is really uh, really strictly necessary, but the position of the horizon uh, is not going to be, uh, is going to be slightly indeterminate, right? And so you could think about a membrane around the horizon, say one plug plane uh, above the horizon, and Alice will cross, you know, will cross that distance. And after that point, uh, whether Alice has actually fallen into the black hole or not, I, I don't think you can really say it. Uh, Um, I mean, are you entangling your particle and the radiation with the black hole, or what? So, this spin yes. is certainly getting entangled with the state of the black hole. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, to the extent that the information is going to be coming out of the black hole in the Hawking radiation, that is necessary. Right? That there's, well, there's some assumption there's going to be some dynamics uh, on the microscopic degrees of freedom that are going to integrate. Uh, you know, that are going to act on this spin. Um, and then ultimately it's going to filter through the Hawking radiation. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. So, uh, you can not see all the radiation is uh, really cool 
that, so that's actually a question. I mean, Bob will not see radiation if he's a freely pollinated server. So we can have Bob. Uh, we can have Bob stay outside the black hole until he's collected enough radiation and, and then pollinate. Um, okay. Uh, so what we can see from the diagram, kind of evidently from the from the diagram, the longer Bob has to stay outside collecting Hawking radiation, uh, the less time Alice is going to have to actually transmit her message, right? Because on this hyperbola, uh, Bob is going to have, or Alice is going to have to send her message in the radial outgoing direction, and the further Bob is up along the, the hyperbola, the less time is going to be available. Okay. And if you do that calculation, what you find is that Alice's proper time is going to go like the radius of the black hole times the exponential of minus delta t over the radius, where this delta t is Bob's delay in short shell times. OK, so this is just the sort of mathematical expression of what we can, we can see already from the diagram. Right, that the longer Bob stays uh, outside the black hole, uh, the less time Alice is going to have available. Okay? And if we want to do this experiment, uh, it's reasonable to place some kind of limit uh, on the energy uh, of, the, uh, of the wave, say, that Alice sends to Bob. Right? And we can, say, we can be very generous without the limit on that energy if we want. So uh, we could say, for example, we're going to limit Alice's energy. to say that tau uh, should be at least um, 1 over m, right? So if we want the, uh, if we want the energy uh, of, the, of the wave packet to be less than essentially the, the mass of the black hole itself, right? then this is the, the constraint that we're going to extract. And so if we just plug that in, we get a limit. So, yeah. So, uh, can you please explain once more what, what do you mean by the star rate and one by the I didn't really understand. Tau. Tau greater than one by n. He's asking oh. why is the pop proper type yes. bounded by the mass. So, this is just asking that the, the frequency uh, of Alice's message, the 1 over tau, um, should be smaller than the mass of the black hole, right? So the, ener the energy of this wave packet uh, should not be so big that it's actually going to be some constant you know, capable of co you know, completely distorting the geometry of the black hole. Um, and so if we plug that in, uh, what we get is that, uh, sorry, that delta t should be smaller than r log mr. Okay. And the mass of the black hole, if you recall, uh, is proportional to the radius. And so this is, again, this is just r log r. And, and this is the, uh, essentially, a constraint that we get out uh, that if we are going to be able to perform this experiment uh, in which Bob jumps in after Alice, and Alice and Bob uh, manage to compare uh, their two clones, then the amount of time that Bob stays outside the black hole should not be too much. And how much is that? Well, it's at most radius log radius. Okay? So 
what we what we want. Uh, so so this is required <coughs> to be able to compare points. Um, so to fail, right? And that's what we actually want to happen. That we're interested in, in uh, the conditions that are actually going to make black hole complementarity uh, self-consistent. And so this means that a condition that we need, uh, or uh, that we would like to be able to verify, uh, which is that the the amount of time that information stays inside the black hole is at least this long. Because if it is, then the little thought experiment that we've just discussed is going to fail, right? That when, Alice, uh, when Bob tries to jump in after Alice to, to compare the clones, uh, they're not going to be able to compare them, right? So to fail, uh, we want T info. The T info is just going to be the amount of time that the information is stuck inside the black hole should be larger than R log R. So delta T was the time that Bob was collecting the Yeah, exactly. Right? As measured by a, a Schwarzschild observer. Yeah. Um, and I'll just call this the black hole complementarity consistency condition. So that was kind of all by, all, all by way of introduction, right? I wanted to get to uh, some quantum information. But I think now we're actually there. Uh, so what, we have to, what, we, what we're interested in now uh, is trying to see uh, to what extent do we actually think that this inequality is going to hold. Uh, because if we can start to think about, you know, at least uh, you know, in very general terms about what's going to happen in an operation process, uh, if we can become convinced that this inequality, inequality holds, uh, we can develop some confidence that this second resolution is a, is a decent resolution of the paradox. Yeah? So is t info same as tau? Uh, no, so, t, so tau is the, the Alice proper time after she crosses the event horizon uh, to send off her message. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, t info here. Uh, this is the delay as measured by it uh, in short chill time. Uh, that an observer, or Bob, has to stay outside collecting radiation before he allows himself to drop it. Yeah. Uh, question? Yeah. Uh, so, do you need to that the information doesn't come out for that much time, or not all the information comes out? Um, like, can you can some of the information come out by, by this? Because you said it will be complicated and in, encoded in a complicated way in the radiation. So, oh, okay. So, yes. So it could be that some information comes out, some other information does not come out. Like this is now where we have, we want to start doing some quantum information to develop a feel for what you know, what might happen to that to that information, how might it come out? So that, that's what I wanted to start talking about. Um. Right. Uh, so the Um, that's a possible other constraint that I wasn't uh, I wasn't thinking about too much. Um, but that's that. I mean, if that's operative, that would only make this inequality stronger, right? Uh, and this is going to be enough for us to think about it. Tomorrow. Okay, so when I started up this morning, I said, I said okay, well, we're, we're, going to be, we're going to be studying some quantum information topics motivated by black holes, and I listed four of them. We're now about to get to number one. So now we're starting some quantum information. Uh, and this, uh, I'm going to say this is a sec, we'll call it information retention. The page on sats. 
But we're, what we're going to really be talking about right now uh, is the properties, the entanglement properties of generic quantum states. Um, and so we want to try to get a qualitative understanding uh, of how information might come out of a quantum system. And so let's just think about a quantum state, which is a member of a product Hilbert space. This is definitely a naive view of what might possibly be happening in the black hole context. Uh, it certainly is uh, quite likely more complicated than this. Um, but we want to think about uh, what happens in the generic case, right? And in particular, what we want to know is, uh, so we want to think about the properties of typical states. So here, the I guess we get, we we start to see a, well, uh, at least a, the glimmerings of a connection to, to, to the theme of this of this school, uh, which is that if there is some dynamics uh, which take this infalling spin and then encode it in the Hawking radiation, and the Hawking radiation is essentially thermal, uh, then that studying the properties of typical quantum states um, of the radiation uh, is going to be essentially uh, the same thing as thinking about uh, thermal radiation states. I could talk about the thermal case. We'd have to be, you know, I'd have to make this a little bit more complicated. But the message is going to be essentially the same: uh, that a, a highly mixing transformation on the black hole radiation Hilbert space is going to produce a typical state, and then we can think about what the properties of those typical states are. So. The question we want to know uh, does the density operator of the radiation for a typical quantum state uh, depend on the state itself? Right? So Because if it doesn't, then by only looking at the radiation, uh, then we can't recover any information about what the actual quantum state is. Okay. Uh, so this is a this is a question. You know, this is sort of a um, a way of, ex of thinking about uh, how information leaks out of quantum systems that are highly mixed. Excuse me. What does T I'll tell you. So what I mean by typical in this context is just going to be that phi is selected uniformly at random uh, from all states on this Hilbert space. Right? So according to the unitarily invariant measure. Um, again, if we wanted to, uh, to do this in a context that was a little bit more appropriate uh, for <coughs> thermodynamics, what we would say is there's maybe a black hole in radiation Hilbert space. There's a subspace of constant energy. And we choose a state at random from the subspace of constant energy. Uh, but the, the qualitative features of the discussion are going to be the same. So I'm going to think about this simple situation. Yeah, so, so, so typically in condensed matter systems, for example, so if you choose typical states of this type, most of the states cannot be realized by evolution with local autonomies. Sure. So then, okay, so then how, how can you use this for? Um, so, one of the justifications would be that when you actually look at the candidate Hamiltonians, uh, the candidate dynamics, or what's what's happening in this context, uh, they're actually not. They don't look like the condensed matter Hamiltonians. They're actually highly non-local. Um, so, I'd say that's that's one way of of starting. Um, okay. So, this is the question that we want to answer, right? Um, do typical states, i.e., states that are chosen at random, so
does the radiation density operator actually depend on which state got chosen? Uh, and let's just uh, let's try to actually work that out. Um, so let's just say that my black hole Hilbert space is going to be, I'm going to restrict uh, to some finite dimensional subspace. So B here is going to be roughly the exponential of the entropy of the black hole. My radiation Hilbert space, I'll do the same thing. And CR, I'll say my total dimension is B times R. And we want now, we want to answer this question, does, does this radiation, uh, dens or radiation density operator actually depend on the state? And the way we're going to get at it is by using this function that I call the purity. So, P of rho, which is going to be the trace of rho squared. And this is going to be a substitute for the entropy. Because it, uh, we're going to use it because it's easy to calculate. Uh, and this, uh, this rho uh, has the property that if, uh, so, or rather P, if rho is a pure state, then P of rho, what is it? Well, it's the trace of the square of omega, but omega is a projector, so it's just the trace of a projector, so it's one, rank one projector. Whereas, if rho is the maximally mixed state, so one over n, one over n, one over n, it's some n-dimensional Hilbert space, then p of rho is equal to n times one over n squared. So it's one over n. And these are actually a set here. Um, and to do that, I'm just going to give you, I mean, this is in principle a calculation that's easy to do, right? Uh, phi is just a unit vector in you know, some d-dimensional space. Uh, so you could just do all, you could do all this in polar co or, uh, hyperspherical coordinates. But I'm interested in the case where uh, d, we're talking about a black hole, right? So, uh, so a solar mass black hole, the entropy uh, is on the order of, I believe, 10 to the 70th bits. Uh, right? So I don't want to do spherical coordinates. Um, it's a nice little trick uh, that allows us to estimate this with very little effort. Um, Patrick? Yeah? What would be the trace of rho squared? Rho squared itself is a diagnosis. Rho squared equal to rho, then be a pure state. Uh, if rho squared is equal to a, yeah, so that would be a way of diagnosing it. Um, I want to get I want to get a number out, oh, right? so, that, so that I have a total ordering on states. Um, and well, we're, <laughs> we're running a little bit low on time. Uh, we can actually define an entropic quantity out of p, uh, so we can relate things directly to the von Neumann entropy. Um, so how to do the calculation? Uh, yeah. So Oh, well, I was just saying that um, in what we're going to, so we want to calculate the expectation value of the purity by radiation. Okay? Um, and, I mean, this is just the average over some sphere of some polynomial function. So it's, it's not a very challenging thing in principle, uh, but um, this is an extremely high dimensional sphere. Right? We, want to, we actually want to know how this behaves as a function of these uh, parameters B and R. Um, so I'm just saying that, um, I'm just going to show you a trick that allows you to, to estimate this calculation you know, super, super easily. Okay? So here's my trick. So now, hopefully, you're, you're going to learn something that you can use you know, for your, maybe a lot of you probably already know this already, but you can use uh, for your own purposes. Um, so, we're going to approximate phi by a Gaussian vector. So we're going to write phi is the sum over j and k of some gjk 
J on the black hole, K on the radiation. And my GJKs are going to be complex Gaussians, a mean zero, and variance 1 over B. So if I do this, this gives me a uh, spherically symmetric distribution. But uh, you look at it, you can say, right, you can look at it and say, wait a minute, this quantum state that you've written down is not normalized. Right? Because the, the coefficients in my quantum state are, are just independent random variables. And so pretty clearly, I mean they don't need to necessarily add up to one. Uh, but what is certainly true is that the expected length of our vector which is the sum over j and k of g, j, k squared. So I'm taking complex Gaussian of variance 1 over d. Uh, the sum over j and k is a sum over, uh, sum over b, a sum over r, so over d elements. So this is d times 1 over d is 1. So at least an expectation, uh, you know, the length of my vector is right. How do you know that GJKs are uncorrelated? Oh, by hypothesis. Uh, or not by hypothesis, by construction. I'm just choosing it independently. So that, this is how I define my vector. I'm going to do a little slightly boneheaded calculation. Uh, just because uh, for your tutorial, you're actually going to work this out for yourselves. Uh, but I'm just going to do a, a little baby version of it, uh, which is to calculate the variance of this length. Right? So what about the expectation value of phi squared minus the mean value? All right, so this is the variance. Well, this is going to be a sum over j and k, a sum over m and n of the expectation of g, j, k, g, m, n, all minus 1. Right? And so if I want to evaluate this expectation, then I have to be concerned uh, gjk is independent of gmn provided that, G, that jk is not equal to mn. And otherwise they're the same. Right? So I'll break up the sum. So there's a sum over jk not equal to mn of the expectation gjk squared expectation gmn squared plus the expectation over jk of gjk fourth minus 1. Right? So what do we have? Uh, on the first line, we have Uh, make sure I get this right. We have our JKs, so they're D of, D of those. Uh, we have our MN, so they're D of those. They're D squared. But we take out the ones that are the same. And then we have the expectation value of the square. So that's 1 over D. And we have two of those. Now here, we have D terms in our sum, and the expectation value of the fourth uh, power of a complex Gaussian is 4 over D squared. And then we subtract off 1. So we have D squared, 1 over D squared, that cancels the 1. We have 4 over D, that we subtract out, subtract off a 1 over D, so this is 3 over D. Yeah? 
choose to get. Why isn't the inner product of the state vectors itself one by normalization always? Um, so what I've defined here is a, just a vector, right? And I've defined a vector uh, in this part using this, this specific prescription. And in my prescription, I've said the coefficients of my vector are independent Gaussians, uh, mean zero variance one over b. So I'm not saying it's a state vector. I'm just saying it's a vector, right? Um, and if I choose my my Gaussians this way, then the expected length of the vector is one, as it should be for a quantum state. Um, but it's not necessarily it's not necessarily going to be exact. It, you know, the the distribution is not going to be uh, a delta distribution. So now I'm going to calculate the variance. And my point is, uh, the reason I, well, I went through this little calculation just as a demo, like you know. Uh, during the tutorial, you'll do the, uh, the full calculation. Um, what we find is the variance of the length uh, goes like 1 over d. Right? And so while the vector is not exactly normalized, it's very close to being normalized. Right? Uh, the length of the vector is going to be 1 plus or minus this 1 over the square root of d. And so this uh, gives us a very quick and dirty way to actually work with random, vector, random muted vectors uh, if we're allowing ourselves a little fudge factor, um, which is just to use Gaussian vectors with independent coefficients. So, so this means that if you look at phi, and the probability of phi is 1, there's some distribution, and the width of the distribution is 1 over square root of d, right? Which means that for all intents and purposes, uh, in the regime that we're interested in, which is d is absolutely enormous, we might as well just work with these, independent, the, these, these vectors that are approximately normalized, but not exactly normalized, OK? Um, and in the tutorial, just using exactly the same technique here, what I'd like you to show is that the expected purity of the radiation is 1 over r plus 1 over b plus 2 over br. All we'll have time to do now is just try to interpret what that means. <coughs> yeah. What do you mean by having purity more than 1? So, what, so from this calculation, you can have purity. Um, oh, so yes, the purity, uh, more than one. Oh, yes, so the point being, this calculation, right, uh, or the Gaussian approximation, is only a good approximation in large dimension, right? So you can have a number that's large, larger than one if r and v are, are very small. But you should think of r as being, yeah, uh, at least a billion, right? Uh, I mean, for a, again, in, in the black hole context, for large black holes, it's going to be on the order of e to the 10 to the 70. Right? So, <laughs> so basically, your d is so huge that the variance goes to zero. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So for all intents and purposes, this is a unit vector. Um, OK. Um, so how do we interpret that result? So if B is much larger than R, right? So think of this as uh, early on in the evaporation of the black hole, right? So that the, the size of the black hole Hilbert space is much larger than the effective size of the effective radiation Hilbert space. Uh, then. The expected purity uh, is almost 1 over r, right? Because uh, 1 over r is the dominant term uh, right here. And as we've seen, if it were exactly 1 over r, then the state would be exactly the maximally mixed state, right? 
And so to the extent that this state really does, it, it really does approximate the maximally mixed state, uh, all of these typical states look exactly the same on the, radi on the radiation, uh, for, in the radiation density operator, right? So, so phi rad uh, is approximately the maximally mixed state. Uh, let's just say the high probability uh, for typical states, um, for random states. So typical states um, don't reveal any information right? as long as you have this condition. Uh, and this uh, so we, we, I mean, we haven't actually done the calculation, but it's not a, it's not a difficult calculation. Well, qualitatively, what does this mean? Uh, it means that if you think of these typical states, uh, when we look at the reduced density operator, if the state was a product state, a state on black hole tensor state on the radiation, then the reduced density operator would, would itself be a pure state. And so uh, the reduced density operator on the radiation is a mixed state if and only if the state is entangled. And what we're finding is that typical states are not just entangled, but they are extremely close to being as entangled as they could possibly be. Right? And if you do large deviations analysis, I mean, uh, you actually are, are going to be very, very close uh, to being maximally mixed with extremely high probability. Uh, and so you really don't, uh, by looking at radiation, um, you cannot learn much about what the initial state that was prepared. Um, and I'd like to contrast this. This is something very particularly quantum mechanical. I'll, I'll contrast tomorrow. Uh, I'll contrast now. Okay, so, uh, so what we've done is we've, we've taken, well, we have this, uh, this Hilbert space of a black hole part and a radiation part, and we've just chosen a typical, typical state, state from the joint Hilbert space. And what we find is that as long as the radiation part is significantly smaller than the black hole part, uh, we shouldn't expect to learn anything from the radiation part if the states are typical. So what would an analog of this be in the, in the classical setting? Well, let's say that we have two random variables, xj and yj. Okay? Uh, or rather, uh, z1 and z2, uh, each of which uh, is a joint random variable. Um, and let's say that xj can take values from 1 to b, right? So the analog of our b-dimensional black hole Hilbert space, and yj could take values from 1 to uh, r. The uniformly distributed? Yeah, I'm just going to say they're uniform and independent. And so what is the probability? This is kind of, you know, this is a op totally trivial calculation, but just to make a point, what is the probability that we can learn about the, which state was prepared, right? Uh, what is it, uh, whether this, whether the, the joint state was Z1 or Z2 by just looking at the Y part, right? Uh, well, it's a, it's a probability these two things are different in the uniform distribution. Right? Uh, and so for large R, uh, in the classical setting, if you were to just look at, uh, you know, if, if, your, if your state was prepared uniformly at random, and you just look at one half of it, uh, then surely by just looking at one half of it, you're likely to be able to, uh, to learn something about the whole. So what we've seen with the, in the quantum mechanical, 
uh, setting is something very distinct, right? That the uh, that joint that states of a joint Hilbert space, um, in contrast to joint states of a joint random variable, when you just look at one half, uh, in many circumstances you can learn nothing at all about what the uh, what the joint state was. Um, so this, this is just an indication, that you, uh, just so that you're you're aware that what we're seeing here is a manifestation of something particularly quantum mechanical and indeed entangled. Um, I'm supposed to be done at 11. So I think I'm just going to very quickly uh, introduce an, an, entrop an entropic measure. Okay? So, so this trace of rho squared is a special case of a, uh, essentially a kind of entropy. So we can define a quantity called the Renyi entropy, which I'll write as S alpha of rho, which is 1 over 1 minus alpha times the log of the trace of rho to the alpha. Okay, so our uh, our purity is essentially the, the Renyi 2 entropy. Um, and with this definition, if we take the limit alpha goes to 1 of S alpha of rho, what we get is the von Neumann entropy. Okay? And these, these Renyi entropies, which is something you can check on your own, uh, have the nice property that if alpha is bigger than beta, then S alpha is smaller than S beta. Right? So, uh, so the Renyi entropies are monotonically decreasing functions of alpha. So from the calculation that we did, uh, we can conclude that the entropy, the expected value uh, of the entropy of the radiation is at least uh, minus the log of 1 over r plus 1 over b plus 1, 2 over br. Okay. And in particular, uh, if B is bigger than R, this tells us that the expected radiation entropy is approximately 1 over R. And if B is smaller than R, And so, what does this look like? So I'm going to be, I want to plot the, the entropy of the radiation as a function of log r. Right, so as the, as the black hole evaporates, the effective radiation Hilbert space increases, right? Uh, and the plot that we get out of this is that it's a tent, exactly like so. So I'm having to do it fairly quickly. Um, but on the upslope, the, the entropy of the radiation is, uh, is as large as it can possibly be. So on the upslope, it's completely featureless. And so on the upslope, you, you don't learn anything uh, by looking at the radiation. And on the downslope, the von Neumann entropy of the radiation is less than it could be. Right? It could be as large as log r, but it's only log b. So once you actually reach this point, uh, it looks like you have information being released.
And so the message, there's no information until a constant fraction of the black hole entropy has radiated away. And this gives us an estimate for the information retention time, that it should be proportional to the black hole lifetime. Because the black hole has to evaporate away a constant fraction, in fact, at least half of its entropy. And it turns out that this goes like R cubed. Yeah? So far, there is nothing specific about the black hole. No. They come back to no, the this, the this, is, this is just a bathtub. This is just a bathtub, right? Uh, but it's a quantum mechanical bathtub. Right? So, but uh, in order to get this information in R quotas of your system, at least, uh, you need exponential in um, it, de it depends what kind of information you're trying to get, right? Like if you actually want to characterize the state, the whole state phi, uh, then you need, you need many copies. But if, if phi is just one of two different possible states, right, uh, then there exists some very complicated... If you start from your random state, it's fine. And suppose you want experimentally to figure out whether it's random or not, whether you operate it once or this is... I agree. No way you'll find it right. out unless you have exponentially many identical copies. Right. No, I, I certainly agree. But in principle, you could say, well, I have a black hole, and I know what state of, I prepared in one of two states, and I understand the dynamics. Uh, and it's going to be a very, very, you know, uh, it's going to be a very, very complicated measurement. But if you know the dynamics, in principle, you could predict, right? Uh, or you could, you could calculate what kind of measurement to perform. Uh, but the, the message, I, th I think th this, this came out. I mean, ba Page, made the, Page made this observation back in the 1990s, right? And the, the key point, I mean, a, a very, I think a very interesting point is that quantum information is behaving very differently than classical information work, right? That if you just think of mixing dynamics, dynamics of a classical system, then you expect to see signatures of the initial state uh, immediately uh, in the radiation. But when you think about a quantum mechanical system, uh, you don't expect to see any signatures of the original state until the black hole, or uh, until the system has uh, has evaporated away a large quantity of its radiate of its uh, of its original original entropy. Um, again, under this typical state assumption. So, uh, if this provided some kind of intuitive explanation, uh, or at least a a reason why attempts to find uh, a mechanism that would imprint the uh, quantum information to, into, the, uh, into the radiation coming out of uh, a black hole uh, might be doomed to fail. Right? Because the, it, it could very well be that the only way you'd be able to see such, such signatures is by tracing the dynamics all the way through a significant fraction of the evaporation time. Okay? So, um, that was the message back in the 1990s. Um, and the rough estimate of the information retention time that comes out of these qualitative arguments is that it should be on the order of R cubed. Right? Uh, but we, what we saw at the beginning of the lecture was that in order to be able to perform an experiment where you'd verify cloning, uh, you'd have to be able to collect the, the radiation in a time of R log R before jumping back in. Uh, and at least you know, these qualitative arguments suggest that at the time of R log R, there's not going to be any information in the radiation if you really have strongly mixing dynamics. Uh, and so the experiment is bound to fail. And so that, that was, again, the qualitative argument as it stood uh, in, you know, in the 1990s. And we're going to revisit this uh, in the coming lectures. Uh, yeah? Another point you don't understand correctly. So if out of this information, like whatever, G, uh, you lose just one, one particle, you completely destroy everything. You think so, but actually no. No? No. Um, that's going to be a feature of quantum error correction. Uh, that if the, if, the, if the dynamics is strongly mixing, um, then as long as you have enough particles, you're going to be able to recover the quantum information. It doesn't matter which particles they are. 
And so you know, if, if you lose this one, you'll be fine as long as you get another one. Uh, so we'll get there. Um, but uh, if you have strongly mixing dynamics, then uh, it delocalizes your information, then you effectively create quantum error corrected codes. Okay, yeah. Uh, are there special, very special states, more than states where I regain the classical uh, Um. Yes, I mean, I think that a, a, a lot of the states that you actually uh, will find in real physical systems um, have properties like that. That if you introduce uh, introduce some locality, um, then uh, then I think that generally generally speaking, you're, you're not necessarily going to see this. Very, very They'll, they'll be very atypical in the Hilbert space, but the states that you that you typically find, say, as the ground states of condensed matter systems, are, you know, the, uh, are are very atypical. Um, at the same time, if you think of say systems with topological order, uh, they uh, they don't behave quantitatively like these ones, but qualitatively they do. Right? In the sense that, say, you have a system with topological order, degenerate ground state, uh, one way of thinking about topological order is that by looking at some significant number of particles, uh, you're not going to be able to learn anything about which of the ground states you're actually, you're actually holding. And so that's, again, that's very much a reflection of uh, the same type of phenomenon. Yeah, so what you can do is you can, you can imagine sort of cutting things off because the, uh, there's a finite speed of propagation for the radiation. And so you can put everything effectively sort of in a box at a given time. Oh, um, that would be a different scenario. I was just thinking like an, not a physical box, but just uh, you sort of uh, look at the degrees of freedom only within some, some particular volume uh, where the modes are excited. Yeah. Getting back to this information paradox, this black hole paradox, I understand that Bob can retrieve information by letting himself fall into the black hole as well. But how could that be contained in the Hawking radiation? Because that's outside the horizon. And any signal Alice sends will take infinite time by time to reverse it. Oh, uh, right. Outside so, the horizon. Yeah, so that's why um, if you. If you think about the experiment that, uh, that we were thinking about, uh, the state is determined um, before Alice falls into the black hole. Right? That the, the Alice is holding a spin, uh, but that spin is set to some state phi, and then Alice falls with it into the black hole. Right? Uh, and so it's not as if, uh, well, yeah. the, the, the setting isn't being performed in the interior. At the same um, at the same time, the, the hypothesis that we're working with, which is that the inform information comes out in the Hawking radiation, is a direct violation of, causal you know, of causality. Right? That if you look at the, uh, the space-time diagram, or, you know, it's just a definition of the event horizon, nothing should be able to come out of the black hole. Um, and what we're actually postulating is that that space-time diagram is that semi-classical approximation breaks down somehow. The information does come out, but in some very subtly encoded way. Oh. Yeah. About this last argument, I, I was thinking, could you just say that, well, by this sparking radiation, the mass of the black hole decreases, so the event horizon recedes. Mm -hmm. and so you regain the possibility of getting information out of the area between the previous and the present event horizon. Um. I think that I mean I think this is something that hasn't been explored, uh, but there's no indication that the, the information is really stored on a thin membrane right inside the event horizon to be exposed. Uh, when the thing evaporates completely, then everything is transparent. So. Yeah. Again, I'm not an expert on those kinds of calculations, and maybe assume it is more. But uh, again, when that that idea is explored. Uh, it doesn't provide a, you know, an avenue to get enough information out of the black hole. Uh, the puzzle diagram we wrote down is so true. 
Um, yeah, so I didn't have time, but uh, you, know, you can make it an exercise uh, to, to show that the fact that the expectation value of trace row squared implies this inequality. No, no, but I'm just saying there's a typo in the next line of the next one. Oh, I see. Yeah, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. So I have lecture notes that are written, so we'll post those on the web. Um, and just two uh, closing comments before we go, uh, which is that the, one of the messages, I, this is a school on thermalization. Uh, and what we saw right here is that this page time estimate um, suggests that the, the appropriate time scale for thinking about information coming out of a black hole is the evaporation time scale. Uh, and what I'll argue next day is that in some scenarios, some kind of thermalization time scale for the black hole is actually much more likely uh, as the correct time scale for, for information coming out of the black hole. So that's how we're going to make some contact with thermalization. Um, so I should probably let you have your break. Uh,